Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, yeah, good evening. I'm yeah, glad to see all of you uh, joining us. I see we have a, uh, around 75, going to 80 participants, and it's six o'clock. It's six o'clock. I think it would be a good uh, idea to to start off this uh, presentation. <coughs> so I'm going to do the moderation and. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank all of you for taking this uh, chance to uh, join us for this uh, KSA uh, Sanofi presentation. I'd also like to thank the KSA and Sanofi for making this uh, meeting happen. So our, our topic today, we have uh, a topic uh, uh, as it was addressed in the email, that is a COVID-associated coagulopathy. And uh, Dr. Ongwendo will be uh, deliberating more on the divergence and the similarities with sepsis associated coagulopathy. So it's my uh, pleasure to invite all of you. But before we get to Dr. Ongweno, we have the pleasure of having a, a case presentation by Dr. Anne Bugera, who is a physician intensivist at the KNH uh, ICU. So I'd like to take this chance to invite Dr. Anne Bugera for the case presentation. Karibu, Dr. So, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? No, we can hear you. We can hear yes, you. Yeah. So, if you can hear me, then let me start now. Eh? Hello? Proceed, Dr. You are clear. Okay, fine. And yeah, the slides are visible. Fine. Okay. I am welcome. Now, we are going to talk about uh, coagulation issues in this new pandemic. Uh, COVID-19. So I come from Kenyatta University, and then it is but a teach Next slide. Okay. Now, one thing which we need to know that when the disease started, the symptoms have been in the respiratory system. And therefore, that is why it got its name, severe acute respiratory syndrome. And uh, the severe form, actually what is called critical, are been uh, ARDS-like. But however, those ones were initial, initial in uh, observation. The current knowledge and information which is coming in is that this actually involves almost all now, look at that picture. If it was involving the respiratory system, but then a patient after 10 days or 14 days uh, in the hospital presents with gangrene. So this one gives that actually the disease is not actually limited to the respiratory system. It involves the vascular system in the blood. And then we tell you the relationship later on. <clears throat> Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Which I got from uh, Italy. Are you okay? Fine. Let's proceed. Now, what has been observed? The information which is coming in that the patients who are admitted with COVID disease, eighty-five percent of them are asymptomatic. They recover and there is no sequelae. Some of them develop mild, moderate, moderate illness. Then the severe to critical okay. that come to ICU. Okay. So, uh, in Netherlands, it has been worked out that the observations of thrombosis. No, I hardly see him here. He is always in LDR. Oh, you cannot see me? Can you see me? So, this slide says <clears throat> indicates that with every day the incidence of uh, the incidence of thrombosis of the patients admitted with COVID in ICU increases such that by the second week uh, the incidence uh, is around 40 <clears throat> percent and the, probably people have been talking about the initial uh, call for
of this process in arterial, it involves the big vessels and the small vessels. And actually, the, most of the problem is actually in the small vessels, which is called microvascular thrombosis. Now, <clears throat> uh, since the disease is very severe and in very infectious, we have not been able to give patients a definitive diagnosis. In this country, we have never not done any postmortem. But in Italy and the US, where postmortem has been done on those patients who are, in, who are being treated for ARDS. Now, what, they, what is coming out is clearly that these patients have thrombus in the pulmonary veins, and some of them, uh, it's not obvious, not all of them have the PE, the embolus, uh, as we know it. Some of them have microvascular, the small vessels, which cannot be picked up by the radiology. So the radiology, spiral CT scan, can only pick the embolus in the big vessels, that is macrovascular. So actually what they are saying, that the incidence or the prevalence of thrombosis in these patients is very high, and unlike what people had been expecting before. So it is no longer a purely respiratory disease, it is a, a vascular disease. And that explains why when the patients are being ventilated, the oxygenation is very poor, but their carbon dioxide is very normal. So what they have is shunt-like. It's because the blood vessels are blocked. Now, this is also showing the spiral CT scan uh, of the patient uh, from uh, day five up to day 14, which when they followed up the patient, and they could see actually the evidence initially what they have is just vascular thickening, and then the so-called ground glass opacity, which many CT scans always give, and that is what people have been treating as ARDS. So ARDS, that is the microvascular thrombosis at an early stage. But then, later on, as the disease progresses, by day 12 to 14, you get actually macrovascular disease as per this CT scan, which had also been confirmed by postmortem. This is still showing the CT scan of these patients. I read it. Now, <clears throat> most of the time, because the CT scan and postmortem, because of the infectious nature, we are not able to get those ones. Actually, in this country, when I try to ask the KU hospital whether they have done, they say, no, that uh, place is used for cancer patients, so they cannot transport the patients because of that. So what is accessible to most clinicians is blood investigation. <clears throat> so uh, when they did uh, in a study in Italy that did uh, uh, collected data on patients who are non-COVID and patients who are COVID, and they did uh, looked at the embolus in various places in the lungs, DVT, myocardial infarction, that is the heart, in the cerebral ischemia, that is the present with stroke, limb, even in the intestine, in mesenteral ischemia. This one still showing you the data which has been collected, which is still in reinforcing. The data which was collected in China, the data which collected in Italy, the data which is in Netherlands, US and UK, is showing that COVID patients are three times likely to develop PE than the non-COVID patients. And it is not limited to the lungs alone. You get it in the, uh, in the legs, the brain and the other one. So what this one <clears throat> is illustrating that most of those patients which we have been treating for ARDS, actually those are microvascular thrombosis. 
we are unlike the infection. <clears throat> so then, now back to the blood, uh, back to the blood uh, investigation. What is usually available is the routine investigation uh, test, PT, PT, APTT. But I must warn you that if you rely on this routine coagulation test, PT and APTT, these tests are usually normal. There is no difference between COVID and non-COVID, and you cannot make a diagnosis on that. So therefore, they are not very sensitive to uh, point to out where there's a coagulopathy. But then, if you are able to do D-dimers, actually this is where the suspicion came from. <clears throat> you did dimers are usually not routinely done, but at the time when they started doing it, these patients have very high levels of D-dimers. You look at this one here, this patient had 4,877 again, uh, a, a normal one of less than 500. Uh, so then <clears throat> this is the one of the suspicions that gives you that there is something which a clot is being formed, but it is also being dissolved. But at the same time, these patients, they have a lot of inflammation because they are acute. They produce a lot of fibrinogen, as you can see. Fibrinogen is twice the amount. Now, apart from this DVT, which is uh, showing you there, there is this antithrombin. Antithrombin is the one that uh, blocks thrombin from uh, activating fibrinogen. Surprisingly, these patients have a lower level of antithrombin, as this data can show. The normal one here you can see is 100, but this one, they have 74. So this one, there is an imbalance of uh, negative regulators. So therefore, the thrombin is left unopposed, right? Then when you look at the other regulators, protein C and protein S. So what this, up to there, this lab test is telling us that D-dimers D is emerging to be an indicator of disease severity and indicator of clot formation and its dissolution. And that one is also explained in the background of the negative regulator of antithrombin. was 103, but this patient had 529. Now what Volibrin does is usually it is very low level. When you see a high elevated Volibrin factor, that tells you that there is an in injury to the endothelium. So what this tells us that there is endothelial injury as evidenced by increased von Willebrand factor and increased clot formation as evidenced by the d dimers So the soluble coagulation factors are forming clots and they are finding, they are binding to an injured endothelium. So this is what this slide is telling you, that there is indecision of injury accompanied by in enhanced clot formation in the clotting factors in the blood. Now, those are two concepts. Then <clears throat> there is a further study that has used uh, thromboelastography. What this uh, thromboelastogram, the most important thing which I want you to look at is this lysis at 30. So lysis at 30, this one is showing zero normal and this is zero from eight. So what this one illustrates that these patients have fibrinolytic shutdown. The disease that inhibits the fibrinolytic pathway and the clot formation is left unopposed. That is the thrombin and the von Willebrand uh, pathway. So there is clot formation, endothelial injury, and inhibition of the fibrinolytic pathway. <clears throat> so these ones explain the thrombosis 
the clinical thrombosis that you can see in the ischemia of the limbs and the tissues, and also the pulmonary thrombus, which is being seen in the CT scan and the postmortem. Now, <clears throat> another thing which I want to bring to your attention is that if you follow up the daily, every day, the progression of these D dimers, from day four, the D dimers begin increasing. Then from day seven, there's an acute exponential increase in D dimers. Increase in D dimers. So what this one illustrates to us, as we know from the clinical pro progression of the disease, usually most of these patients are asymptomatic, but from day five, the symptoms begin manifesting. That is when they begin manifesting with cough and such kind of thing. That one, the, the clinical symptoms correlate with this d -dimers. So as the disease clinical syndromes, symptoms increase, so do the d -dimers also increase. And this is worse in the non-survivors than the survivors. Then in the background of this increased marker, of uh, DIC, these patients have increased inflammatory mass, the interleukins. So we have increased clot formation and uh, breakdown in the background of uh, interleukins. So there is a, a profound activation of the inflammation. So why do I bring in this inflammation and the D markers? Actually, that is where the pathophysiology is that these interleukins, which they come from macrophages, they activate, they activate, they, they activate the, the neutrophils, and the neutrophils release something called neutro, uh, as a, uh, an enzyme. So actually it is the enzyme from the neutrophils, once they, they've been activated by the interleukins, that becomes, the orchestra of this whole mechanism of thrombosis and coagulopathy. So <clears throat> it does not touch the routine coagulation markers. So this enhanced D dimers actually is what the information, what is being known, is account from the product of breakdown, the break product of the thing, substances coming from the neutrophils and not the fibrinolysis. These patients are actually in fibrinolytic shutdown. So, this one illustrates to you that here, minimal low amount in uh, deriving data from what happens in sepsis bacteria and especially the viral pneumonias. Usually, the neutrophils are no, but you find the neutrophil the lymphocyte ratio in COVID is very high. And when you measure one of the products of the neutrophil, neutrophil elastase is very enhanced, which happens in the other infections. So we suspect it also happens in the COVID. So this product from the neutrophil is what orchestrates everything. It releases the uh, endothelial damages. These are markers of endothelial damage apart from Wolvendebrand factor. So neutrophil plays a key role in the pathophysiology of this disease. <clears throat> you can see in this one here, that this one has been known that neutrophil elastase product is quite elevated in sepsis than control. And the number of neutrophils are all enhanced in COVID. So therefore, it should be the neutrophil which is orchestrating the problem. And in the background of that, this neutrophil elastase, apart from releasing von Willebrand factor, it also destroys the anticoagulant, which is antithrombin, which we had seen, which is lowered in the COVID, and releases, <coughs> and therefore the thrombin is left unopposed, destroys the endothelium, and therefore creates an atmosphere for clot formation, that is uh, thrombus formation. That is what we have learned from the sepsis. This is still illustrating to you that in the presence of neutrophil elastase, the plasminogen activator inhibitor, which is in this normal, 
but in the cell patients, it is quite lower. So the plasminogen activator is what is regulated by the neutrophils. So you have enhanced thrombin, damaged endothelium, and inhibition of the fibrinolytic pathway. Right. So what is the relationship between the pulmonary system and the thrombus, pulmonary thrombus, and the ischemia, acute lung injury, lung injury, acute kidney, and even the cerebral thrombosis, which is a presentation in some time. What is known that when the COVID virus gets into the body, the receptor is angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is quite elaborated in the pulmonary epithelium, respiratory epithelium, and also in the endothelium. So when it infects you, so then the virus gets into the lungs, in the uh, alveoli, and also the endothelium. So once it has gotten there, then the neutrophils come, release their neutrophil uh, elastase. Since the virus is concentrated in that area, then there is destruction of endothelium, endothelium. So therefore you get the presentation of ARDS, a, um, ARDS that is in the alveolar, but also the thrombus formation in the mm -hmm. pulmonary circulation. So therefore, the two of them are interrelated in that way. Then this AC, most, <clears throat> it has been found not only in the pulmonary circulation, you get it also in the mesenteric circulation, in the kidneys, in the prostate, and in the brain. So this one is the common factor that relates where the thrombus is going to be, the receptor for the COVID, ACE, and the ocotensin converting enzyme. That is the receptor. So once the virus bumps into the receptor, gets in, then it forms a, a target for the neutrophil. So what we are seeing is an overreactive neutrophil reaction that destabilizes the blood clotting, the underlying uh, endothelium, and gives us the problem of the thrombus. So then there is also other factor. As the disease becomes severe, it is also being now from science, basic science that hypoxia also contributes to thrombosis. Hypoxia contributes to thrombosis by uh, in, in increasing the tissue factor extrinsic pathway. I will not go beyond the basic sounds, just I know that hypoxia. Endothelium damage, and then the attendant hypoxia, both of them, the two of them, increase the likelihood of thrombus formation. Now, I'm about to summarize that the way the disease comes, we know the COVID comes, and we can draw the lessons from what happens with the other viruses, SARS-1, SARS-2, and the other virus, and even bacterial that the pathogen comes, it interacts with inflammatory cells. These inflammatory cells activate the process okay. of cellular damage, then destruction of the anticoagulant mechanisms, right? Pro like protein C, protein S, and anti-thrombin uh, anti 3 are decreased. Therefore, the thrombin is left unopposed. So you get the thromb thrombus being formed. But at the same time, this neutrophil also uh, destroys the clot. Therefore, the marker is D-dimers. So D-dimers is an early marker of the disease. It can be used to pro, uh, pro temporal um, follow-up of the development of the severity of that. Then you also get fibrinolytic shutdown. These elastases, apart from that, it blocks the plasminogen and increases the level of the inhibitor, plasminogen activator inhibitor in this one. So there is the process of fibrinolysis and thrombosis. So at the end of the day, that is what you get DIC, disseminated intervascular coagulopathy, because the clot is forming, but it's also being formed. But the rate of formation is faster than the dissolution. So therefore, you get the D-dimers marker 
but also the end organ failure because the thrombus has formed inside the, the organs. Right? This is still illustrating what happened. Now, as I conclude, based on this information from what the COVID is beginning to show and what is known from sepsis, therefore, we realize that the patients with the COVID are three times likely to develop thrombosis. So actually, thrombosis is a big problem in these patients, and it's actually the, the major killer in these patients. So they, have, they are hyperglobal and prothrombotic. So now, what the, the Italian Society of Thrombosis, because they are the first one where this were first hit apart from China, they did the laboratory test, the radiological investigation, laboratory investigation, so what the Italian Society of Thrombosis is recommending that these COVID patients should have investigation, routine coagulation, that is APTT, PT, and D-dimers. And D-dimers becomes a marker of prognosis. Then this one should also be done in association with imaging ultrasound of the limbs to look for evidence of DVT. And <clears throat> If possible, if you can do spiral CT, it would be useful. Then, because we now know thrombosis is a big thing, it has become, they have recommended that all patients who admitted with COVID disease should be anticoagulated with anthrocrinic heparin or low molecular weight heparin or fondaparinax. Now, the preference is uh, and the heparin, because apart from being giving you the anticoagulation, they are also anti-inflammatory. As you notice in the previous slide, these patients have a cytokines from the inflammation. So they preserve two markers. Apart from inhibiting clot formation, they slow down the endothelial injury. So they, then anticoagulation should be continued at least seven to 14 days post-discharge. So this one can vary according to the, way the disease severity. Now, the, that was the Italian Society of Thrombosis. The International Society for Thrombosis and Hemostasis has also collected data from many of those countries and has come up with a certain statement that <clears throat> the diagnosis approach for this patient should include D-dimers, routine coagulation tests, and platelet, which should be done every two to three days for assessment of the progression of the disease. Then the therapy of this hospital patient should receive subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin. Although anthracrinal heparin will be better, but low molecular weight is more preferred because it is administered one, so you reduce the contact with the patient, the likelihood of contact and also the transmission. Right, <clears throat> and then they're also saying that angiography or other imaging techniques should also be uh, uh, done to corroborate and enhance the diagnostic worker. So thrombosis is a big issue in the coding patient. So should be approached from the laboratory point of view and imaging point of view, and this patient should be anticoagulated. Now, <clears throat> this slide, the people who like modeling, that it shows uh, this one was <clears throat> a slide taken from China because they have a lot of experience and the model that the virus from the time of onset, the period in which you begin having symptoms is from the fifth day. That is when the virus shedding and you begin having exposure shedding of the virus, right? But at the same time, also at this time when the virus is also increasing, the D-dimers are also increasing. So the D-dimers almost parallels the viral shedding, right? This is what this slide is showing. So D-dimers paralleling uh, viral shedding around seven to 14 days. So this is the most critical time when you catch up the patient. Because when you get an increase in D-dimers, you know the clot has already formed. So what the recommendation is that the anticoagulation should be started early in order to decrease this, the disease severity. 
So now if anticoagulation is started, then it is called flattening of the curve. The D dimers begin regressing, like you see here. So therefore, you reduce the likelihood of these patients having end organ failure and mortality. So anticoagulation is key. But the message which I want to get to from you, as these D dimers, you can follow the progression of this disease. Sometimes if you get by the seven days, you get these D dimers are in thousands. This one, it has involved many organs. So it should be started early, as early as around the fifth day of the onset of the disease or the contract. So anticoagulation is started early, increases the survival. But delayed anticoagulation, the, the worse the outcome, <clears throat> right? That is the message which I wanted to get to present to you, that thrombosis is a big problem in COVID patients. It manifests not only as ARDS, but also PE, sudden death, and many other organs and organ failure. And it can be monitored through laboratory parameters and especially D-dimers. The pathophysiology is that there is enhanced clot formation because of an opposed thrombin, fibrinolytic shutdown, and endothelial damage. And the orchestra in this scenario is the elevated neutrophils which release the product uh, neutrophil elastase that destroys many other things and you end up this. So my, my colleagues, the information which is available now, the anticoagulation saves lives. Thank you. Thank you. Are you able to see me? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Gweno. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yes. Well done, Gweno. Yes. And Anne, are you ready? Hello? Yes. Uh, so, uh, Gwen, how are you? Fine. I wanted a question uh, to ask a question. This is, uh, if somebody dies of, uh, of, 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 of sudden death, yes. and you find that the D-dimers are elevated during this time of, uh, of COVID, yes. uh, you know, we are not doing post-mortem for COVID. Yes. So we are probably going to see many patients dying, and we are seeing evidence of high D-dimers. These are, yes. must be... Do you suspect that such a patient could have died of a pulmonary thromboembolism, uh, possibly due to COVID at this time, because of the high risk of uh, of catching COVID at this time? COVID looks like it is a it is just a risk factor, but if a patient dies and you find that the dimers are raised without any other investigations like CT, because we are not doing postmortems for these COVID patients, we are seeing probably that uh, uh, there'll be many COVID deaths which are undocumented. But if you have the, uh, if you have some coagulation, like you have a D dimer and uh, maybe a, a, a few coagulation tests, you may be able to at least have an idea of 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 how the patient, or what could have happened to that patient. Correct, correct. Actually, that is the message. Yes, again, most of these patients, because we are not giving them the penultimate diagnosis. So we don't know what is killing them, but there is high likelihood that they die from thrombotic episode, which probably we have not picked up. But however, you know, postmortem is the final diagnosis. So what you need to do is you need to start anticoagulation early before you get to the top level of postmortem. I think Anne uh, has, is ready. Let her share with us so that we can discuss together. Okay, Dr. Mugera, um, Karibu, Karibu, go, go ahead with your presentation. I can see your screen. Dr. Mugera, please go ahead. We can mute. Dr. Mugera, are you with us?
Thank Dr. you, Dr. Good presentation. Asante sana. Dr. Mugera. Uh, Dr. Ann, Dr. Nganga, can we have uh, Ann, Ann Sanofi speak probably as Dr. Mugera prepares? In, in, let me see, I'm not seeing uh, questions. Okay, a um, uh, question here from Daniel Lagat. Dr. Nganga, please, uh, yeah. can we have Ann, Ann Bugo of Sanofi present while Dr. Mugera is preparing? Then we do question and answers later, we combine all the questions. Yeah, we can do. We can. We can do that. We can okay. do that. And and uh, and Bubak, you may thank, need to ask uh, Doctor. Okay, thank you very much. You can all see my slides. Yes, we can. Yes, and we can see them. Thank you. So my name is Anne Bogwa from Sanofi, and it's a great privilege and pleasure to always partner with KSA and especially in discussion to saving lives. A great presentation from Dr. Gordon. And as he was discussing about VTE in COVID patients, then I know that our greatest desire is to ensure that every institution that we are representing this day is a venous thromboembolism safety zone. So to start us off, Maybe I'll just want you uh, in your mind to just imagine the number of people who pass on due to road accidents. Yeah, I'm sure right now you're having a number. Those who pass on due to AIDS, maybe not so many, but they're there. Uh, those who pass on due to breast cancer, prostate cancer. The VITA study showed that the patients who passed on due to venous thromboembolism were way above the patients who passed on due to AIDS, due to breast cancer, due to prostate cancer, and due to transport accidents combined. Therefore, venous thromboembolism is truly a global burden. And that's why very briefly today, we would want to get an understanding of the burden of VTE to understand the need for risk assessment of our patients and more so to achieve adequate prophylaxis. Uh, to start us off, I believe my slides are clear from your end. Yes, Anne. Thank you. So to start us off, uh, if we would have a look at the burden of VTE, and this was taken from the ENDO study. The ENDO study confirmed that for every 10 patients who passed on, in the hospital patients, at least one was due to pulmonary embolism. So what are we saying? If in a specific hospital, in a specific duration of time, 50 admitted patients would pass on, then according to ENDO study, five would be due to pulmonary embolism. If 100 in the, major, in the big hospitals would pass on, then 10, according to the ENDO study, would be due to pulmonary embolism. So this made, according to the ENDO study, made VTE one of the leading causes of death, but the best information is that it is preventable. Now, the ENDO study was done in the Western region. It was done uh, over a population of 68,000 patients who are spread out in 358 centers. It was basically a multinational observational study. And the primary objective was to check from this population how many were at risk of VTE 
And the secondary objective was to check how many achieved adequate prophylaxis. So from the, from the study, it showed that out of the population of the 68,163 patients, half of this population were at risk of BTE. However, it was noted that out of the 35,329 patients who are at risk of BTE, only half, 17,000 achieved adequate prophylaxis, according to American College of Chest Physicians. Again, the study was split into two. It was an observational study. So they classified the surgical patients and the medical patient. For the surgical patients, the study showed that for every 10 surgical patients, then six of them were at risk of BTE. And for the medical patients, it showed that for every 10 medical patients, according to the ENDO study, then four were at risk of BTE. However, it was interesting to note, for every 10 patients who are in the surgical ward and at risk of BTE, again, only six achieved adequate prophylaxis according to American College of Chest Physician guidelines. And for the medical patients, only four out of 10 achieved adequate prophylaxis. Therefore, from this, some conclusions were made. And one of them was that it was important to implement hospital-wide strategies on VTE. And two, there was need for, to deliberately risk assess the patient and finally, to achieve adequate prophylaxis. If we would narrow down on the patient, I know Dr. Gordon has explained a, quite a lot on the medical patients. This is a study on the uh, surgical patient. These patients were undergoing surgery. It's the Noxacan study. It had a sample size of 613 patients. It was done in 37 centers. And we would have a brief uh, look at the patients. Uh, the patients were 40 years and above, the life expectancy of more than six months. The patients were to undergo surgery for malignant tumors of GI, genitourinary tract, or female reproductive organs. And the surgery was to take more than 45 minutes under general anesthesia. The patients were to be put on uh, an oxaparin 40 milligrams or a placebo. And how it was done, it was uh, 10 to 14 hours pre-op. The patients were put on an oxaparin 40 milligrams or a placebo. Once the surgery was successful, then the patients were put on either an oxaparin 40 milligrams or a placebo once a day for six to 10 days. The primary endpoint was venous thromboembolism between the 25th and the 31st days. And the secondary endpoint was safety, where bleeding during the three weeks after randomization. Briefly, we can have a look at the bar. I know these are many colors, but I believe we are all in a position to pick red. The red are the patients who had been put on an oxaparin 40 milligram, and the, I would choose to call it sky blue, are the patients who are put on placebo. If we would start from the extreme end, it was interesting to note that from the enoxacan study, there was no patient who was on a, an oxaparin 40 milligrams who got pulmonary embolism. Uh, on the proximal DVT, 1.2% of the patients who are on an oxaparin 40 milligram got proximal DT, and 2.4% of the patients who are on placebo got proximal DVT. When we look at all the VTE, again, the red is the patients who are on an oxaparin 40 milligram, and the sky blue are the patients who are on uh, placebo. Um, this chart shows that the patients who are on placebo for all VTE were 13.8%, while the patients who got VTE and they were on enoxaparin, 40 milligram, were 5.5%. There was a relative risk reduction 
of 60% on the patients who got enoxaparin 40 milligrams. And uh, on the secondary endpoint, it was noted that, that there was no significant difference between placebo and enoxaparin group in major or minor bleeding. And also it was noted that there were no incidences of thrombocytopenia. And this is why as Sanofi, we are confident to present to you Clexin. As Dr. Gordon was presenting, he was quoting the guidelines that would recommend low molecular weight heparin in COVID-19 patients. And uh, I would want to confirm boldly that Clexin is a low molecular weight heparin and with Clexane, you have proven predictable protection in VTE prophylaxis. With Clexane, we have uh, decades of clinical evidence. As you can see, there is documentation of efficacy of Clexane through experience in 1987 and 1997. It was documented Clexin to be effective in DVT prophylaxis in both orthopedic surgery and in abdominal surgery. In 2000, it's an interesting year, especially for the kind of patients in discussion, because Clexin was confirmed in 2000 to be effective in DVT prophylaxis in medical patients. However, in 1998, it was quite interesting in the documentation of Clexane because besides VTE prophylaxis, then Clexane was also confirmed to be effective in VTE treatment. So if we would have a recap on the dosage, um, I noted keenly when the guidelines were being uh, mentioned that the recommendation for for the patients is seven to 14 days post discharge. And it would rhyme with uh, what a Sanofi, the studies would show us because in medically ill patients, then the standard prophylactic dose, in this case, we are talking of those patients, I'm sure you can see them in the medical wards. They are immobile according to the risk parameters used. They are at risk of VTE. So this category of patients, then the standard prophylactic dose is 40 milligrams subcutaneous once daily. And if I would echo what the guidelines are saying, according to Sanofi, then we recommend that these patients should be on Clexane, 40 milligrams subcutaneous OD for six to 14 days or up to when the risk persists. For the surgical patients, the recommendation is 12 hours pre-op, the patients should be administered 40 milligrams of Clexane subcutaneous. This would mean that if a patient is already on Clexane, 40 milligrams, then 12 hours pre-op, you hold the Clexane. Once the operation is successful, then 12 to 24 hours post-operatively, we administer Clexane, 40 milligrams, subcutaneous once a day. If the surgery was general or abdominal surgery, the recommendation is for seven to 10 days post-op. However, if it is orthopedic surgery, then the recommendation is post-operatively up to 21 weeks. However, according to American College of Chest Physician guidelines, if the surgery is a major surgery, in orthopedic surgery, then the recommendation is up to 35 days. I believe that's clear. A brief recap on uh, spinal anesthesia. This is also very key when administering Clexin in the context of uh, epidural anesthesia, extreme vigilance and frequent monitoring must be exercised to detect any signs and symptoms of neurological impairment. Placement or removal of a catheter should be delayed for 10 to 12 hours after administration of DVT prophylactic doses of Clexane. The subsequent Clexane dose should be given no sooner than two hours after catheter removal. 
Now let's ask ourselves who are these patients who may not be put on Clexane. One, if a patient is bleeding from any site, then that patient should not be put on Clexane. Two, if a patient has heparin associated thrombocytopenia, that patient should not be put on Clexane. But as we remember that our desire is to have venous thromboembolism safety zones, then it's good to explore other mechanical ways of VTE prophylaxis for that category of patients. Clexane pre presents in a four pre-filled syringes. I know most of you are very familiar with the 40 milligram pre-filled syringe because it's, uh, it's used more in a prophylaxis and it's color coded yellow. However, we also have Clexane 20 milligram available in the Kenyan market and it's color coded white. We have Clexane 60 milligram that is color coded orange and Clexane 80 milligram that is color coded brown. I know at this time you may be wondering why the 20 milligram, why the 60, why the 80. So for the 20 milligram, you'll find that we have a category of severe renal impaired patients where the creatinine clearance is between 15 and 30 ml per minute. So in that category of patients, then we have the prophylactic dose. So the standard prophylactic dose is 40 milligrams, but that category of severe renal impaired patients, then we administer 20 milligrams of Clexane. When it comes to the year we saw that Clexane was approved for treatment, then you'll find the standard therapeutic dose is one milligram per kg body weight, BD, or 1.5 milligrams per kg body weight, OD. Now, if we look at the Kenyan population, all our weights are very different. However, the 60 milligram pre-filled syringe and the 80 milligram pre-filled syringe are calibrated. So what are we saying? If a patient maybe is 55 uh, kgs and needs the therapeutic dose of Clexane, then that patient would be administered 55 milligrams BD if the doctor chooses to use the one milligram per kg body weight BD. Therefore, the nurse would take the 60 milligram pre-filled syringe and because it's calibrated, discard five five milligrams and administer the exact dose to that patient. Because as we saw from the endos, achieving adequate prophylaxis is very essential in VTE management. If for example, a patient is 90 kgs, what would happen? Then in that scenario, as you can see, we don't have a pre-filled syringe that is 90, 90 milligrams, and the patient would need 90 milligrams uh, of Clexane BD. Then in that case, the nurse would take the 80 milligram and the 20 milligram, and because the 80 milligram pre-filled syringe is calibrated, then they would discard 10 and administer the two pre-filled syringes of 70 and 20 milligrams. And that way we have achieved adequate prophylaxis. So all these pre-filled syringes are available in the Kenyan market. So in conclusion, um, with Clexane, we have proven efficacy. Many, many patients in Kenya and worldwide have benefited from Clexane. And with Clexane, we also have clinically proven safety. The safety window of Clexane is quite wide. However, in case that one patient in a thousand would bleed, then you would not be helpless because we do have an antidote that is protamine sulfate. How would we administer? We would administer one milligram of Clexane, equivalent to one milligram of protamine sulfate, but not exceeding 50 milligrams. Then also with Clexane, we have predictable antithrombotic activity, hence no need for routine monitoring. And with Clexane also, there is ease in administration and the patients can use it at home. Why? Because for example, if a patient is on Clexane 40 milligram, then they will need a pre-filled syringe. And because the administration is quite easy, preferably on the abdominal walls, 
They will just need on the, at their own comfort at home, preferably do a skin fold and administer on their own and discard the, the syringe. Then when it comes to the next dose for the next day, they also administer themselves with ease. And with this, my desire is that as we take care of these patients, then we shall ensure that our hospitals are venous thromboembolism, safety zones, by ensuring that the patients who are at risk of VTE achieve adequate prophylaxis with Clexane, those who need the treatment, then also achieve adequate doses with Clexane. And without much ado, I would want to say thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, it looks to us that Dr. Mugera is unable to join, seems to be having some challenges from her side. So what we are going to do, I'm going to call upon Dr. Susanna Bulindo and Dr. Nganga to take us through the question and answer session. Uh, Dr. Nabulindo, over to you. Um, hello, this is Dr. Nabulindo. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Okello. I will uh, take us through the question and answer session. Uh, Dr. Mugera is having problems with connecting, but she's trying in case she is able to connect, then we'll give her a chance of a few minutes. So I kindly, I know that we have had a lot of technical issue. I kindly ask that uh, we stay put uh, for this uh, very important presentation. Uh, so I will go ahead to questions to Dr. Ogweno. Thank you very, uh, very much, Dr. Ogweno, for the wonderful presentation. A lot of the participants appreciate the very, very informative presentation and uh, also the presentation from Sanofi. Uh, 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 Mr. Lagat is asking, this is to Dr. Ogweno, is it advisable that all patients on COVID uh, uh, with COVID-19 be given thromboprophylaxis? Yes, uh, the, the information which is coming in is that uh, you notice the graph of uh, the D-dimers and the viral shedding begins at a begin rising from the day five. And that is when the symptoms begin presenting. And at that, that time, that is also when the patient get hospitalized. So the recommendation is that all hospitalized patients should receive prophylactic anticoagulation. Preferably, if you can, uh, uh, unfracrated heparin, but it is associated with thrombocytopenia. So low molecular weight heparin becomes uh, fill in the gap because you lessen the gap, the contact with the patient. Now, the severe patients who have hypoxemia, and those are the patients who are in hay. Level of anticoagulation to prescribe for the different levels of disease. So, when do you do preventive anticoagulation? When do you do therapeutic or aggressive anticoagulation? And uh, again, in that breath, what is the recommended drug for outpatient anticoagulation, especially patients you're having saying they are recovered and you're sending them home? Now, uh, the first question that this patient is asking, uh, when do you start at who? And uh, when do you start? Now, if you look at the literature, the Chinese Academy for Disease Prevention and Control, the Wuhan version, they have classified the severity of the COVID. That mild are those patients who have just a slight cough, then you have the severe forms. These are the patients who have fever, who have hypoxemia, and at least one evidence on one organ damage. Then the critical one are the patients who are having difficulty respiratory failure or three or more organ failure. These are the critical ones. So now, now based on the 
need for hospitalization. The moderate to severe would need hospitalization. So as long as a patient meets the criteria of hospitalization, that one will need prophylactic anticoagulation. Then if they move from there, if they become critical, then they need full anticoagulation. Now the question is now which one, which drug to give? Now there is the differences in drug availability across the countries. In China, in Italy, in Netherlands, and even here in Kenya. So you may not Hello, sorry about that, uh, Dr. Gueno. The, that is a question. If you look at the literature, it has been addressed by ICH, International, International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. The observation which they had is that different countries are using different types of anticoagulants and different dosages of those medicines. So now they were unable to say which particular drug should be. It depends. What they say should be the one which is available. But however, the evidence which they say is that unfractionated heparin is very good and very effective. Apart from anticoagulation, it also has anticoagulant effect. Low molecular weight, now if you, you have problem with that, then low molecular weight. Then the other question about the DOAX. Those ones, there is not much experience and therefore they were unable to make a consensus. Thank you, Dr. Gweno. We shall suspend the question and answer session uh, briefly. Uh, Dr. Mugera has been uh, able to connect. You can see her slides. Uh, so Dr. Anne Mugera is a physician uh, intensivist uh, with specialty in uh, cardiology. She's the head of unit of uh, the medical CCU at the Kenosha National Hospital. And she's also leading the team, taking care of the critically ill patients at uh, KNH uh, IDU, ICU. So Dr. Mugera, if you are with us, uh, Karibu. And uh, sorry for the technical hitches uh, that have been there in the last few minutes, okay. Dr. Mugera, you, uh, you can go ahead, just unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay, uh, just uh, give us two minutes. Dr. Mugera will try again. Uh, if she's not able, then we shall be able to move. Uh, sorry again uh, for that persistent uh, technical issue. Yeah, hello, Dr. Mugera. If uh, you are able to, hello now, we can hear you. Okay, let me try sharing my screen. Yeah, your screen is uh, on. Okay, so, yes. right. Uh, I can't see my screen, however. Okay, Dr. Nganga, you can... Uh, we are, I think we're, it's projecting from Dr. Stephen Okello's screen, uh, but I can see the, the screen. Okay, so Dr. Mugera, what we shall do, probably we shall control the presentation. You can just present from your side and tell us when to proceed to the next slide. Okay, I hope we are on the third slide, which is the case of the patient. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. So um, thank you again for inviting me. So I'll present a case of uh, one of the patients that we received in the critical care unit of the, um, the COVID patient. 
a 60-year-old, a 67-year-old female retiree and transferred from another facility in Nairobi. And her symptoms were that of anuria, and she was actually referred for dialysis. The referral diagnosis was acute on chronic CKD and possibly end-stage uh, renal disease. The history was that uh, four days prior to being uh, presenting to the health facility, she had shortness of breath as well as, and prior to that, one month prior, she had lower limb swelling. There was no history of fever, no contact with anybody with flu symptoms, and uh, no history of uh, travel. Next slide. Her medical history was that of hypertension. Um, she had previously had a stroke in 2006 and still had some residual left hemiparesis. Functionally, she did minimal uh, mobilizing and she was assisted in most of the activities of her daily living. Next slide. So on the initial evaluation at A&D, she was speaking in full sentences. Her blood, uh, her uh, respiratory rate was 18 and her SpO2 was 83% on room air and went up to 97 on 10 liters of uh, oxygen or using a non-rebreather mask. Blood pressure, she was hypotensive. She had a heart rate of 58. Temperature was normal at 36.2 and we, at that point of admission, she had no urine output. The GCS was 15 over 15 and she had the residual weakness that uh, was there from 2006. Next slide. So the laboratory investigations basically showed she had a high CRP. She had a, a normal uh, white cell count. However, she had a lymphopenia at 6.5% with a neutrophilia at 84%. Her D-dimer was up more than five times the upper limit of our assay uh, at 5.2. She had a normal platelet count at 295. HB was normal. The, Kidney functions showed the urea was elevated, as was the creatinine, as well as the potassium. Troponin was within normal limits, and her bilirubin was uh, within normal limits. Her blood gas basically showed she, she was hypoxic, and uh, when we did a SOFA score, she scored at seven. The chest X-ray showed just a right lobe consolidation. Next slide. So a diagnosis of congestive heart failure was made with um, possible AKI on CKD, and this was probably exacerbated by a pneumonia. The decision was made that she could go to a medical ward and uh, on oxygen therapy, and we restricted her fluids, and she was commenced on low molecular weight heparin at 40 milligrams uh, subcutaneously. Antibiotics were given for the pneumonia, and she was started on anticongestics that included a loop diuretic, ACE inhibitor, and she continued with chest physiotherapy. Next slide. So um, she remained on the, on the ward uh, and she, on the day 12, she began to, uh, to have worsening of her respiratory symptoms and her chest x-ray increased infiltrates, now bilateral. Previously, it was only a right lower consolidation. At that point, COVID was need, needed to be ruled out, so she was isolated to a whole... She was at that point also referred to the uh, infectious disease units and the CCU uh, area because of increased oxygen demand at 15 liters of oxygen and increased respiratory rate. An echo done on that day showed she had a dilated right atrium and ventricle with elevated pressures up to 74 millimeters of mercury. She had, however, a normal systolic function. A COVID test also turned out positive. Next slide. So based on uh, what we have on the schema that is uh, in front of us, you can notice that she, we were already on high flow nasal uh, oxygen. Of course, we don't have any nasal cannula oxygen, so we are on an angry breather, and, uh, and we, uh, we could not offer her CPAP either. So the next thing would have been to offer her invasive ventilation. So the question arose, was she a candidate for um, uh, invasive mechanical ventilation? Next slide. So of course we decided to score her for frailty and to assess her frailty status. And with 19 critical care, one considers their frailty score. Um, and if you look to the right of the screen, she, was, uh, she had a higher score, which I'll explain later. 
And if you look at the bottom of the right of the screen, there is ward level care as well as referral to critical care. So she had already received ward level care and at this point she was being referred for critical care. So there were the considerations that we needed to uh, take into account and there were potential contraindications for critical care admission, which includes uh, frailty scores of five to six, moderate and progressive cognitive impairment, which she did not have. She did, however, have severe pulmonary hypertension and she had um, pre-existing end organ failure. One, she had a stroke and two, at that point, she was being considered for end-stage renal disease and being considered for dialysis. So using a frailty score, at that point, she was considered moderately fail. And these are people who will need all outside uh, activities to be assisted with and mainly will be kept in the house, which she qualified for. So um, after discussion with colleagues, we decided that she would have active treatment, but not for intubation. And so we increased her anticoagulation from pro prophylactic to therapeutic, and we put her on 60 milligrams BD. Oxygen therapy was, in, was maintained at 15 liters, and uh, she was ma to maintain the SPO2 of 88 to 93. Anti-failure regimen was uh, continued, and as she had already completed a course of antibiotics, we discontinued. Restrictive uh, fluid therapy was um, maintained at 1.5 liters in 24 hours. So her outcome, she was discharged from our CCU uh, to the wards after seven days on five liters of oxygen with an SPO2 of 88 to 92. And as of the 26th, uh, which was Monday, she was doing well on the ward. So our oxygen demand came down purely on our anticoagulation. So based on a publication from China that was published online on the 27th of April, this was a study where 449 patients with COVID were treated with heparin, low molecular weight, for seven days. The overall mortality was similar, but there was a significantly lower hep um, um, in heparin users, it was significantly lower, especially if you had a sepsis-induced coagulopathy score of at least old increase in her D-dimers. So the question that then uh, score or high D-dimers in the management of COVID patients. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mugere. Uh, for the very informative local uh, case uh, presentation. But, uh, the technical hitches did not put you out of uh, Dr. Ogono's presentation because now that ties very well with your case, uh, case presentation. So uh, we shall go back to the question and answer session. And if you have any questions for Dr. Mugere, please just type on the chat and I'll be able to pick them up. Uh, so Dr. Ogweno and uh, Dr. Mugere, you're also uh, welcome to answer any of the questions if you have any comments. Uh, the next question was coming from Mr. Mudanja, who was asking with the information we now have from Italy showing that thrombosis is the, uh, a significant killer in COVID-19. We have not been doing uh, post-mortems here. We all know that there's a rush to bury the patients. He's asking, is it advisable that we now start doing post-mortems here to try and uh, define uh, the extent of thrombosis in causing mortality in these patients? Okay, anyway, I'd answer that in the type on the chat. But anyway, okay. the question which arises is that to minimize to get that diagnosis versus to get that diagnosis. But the only issue which we have in this country, our postmortem areas are not prepared for this uh, disease like this. So all the pathologists shy away from that because of the risk of spreading the virus beyond the, the patient. So that is the way. And uh, the other places which they have, they have very dedicated postmortem areas with the negative pressure uh, suits what we can say but if we are able to do the better for us okay so dr sheila gitau uh, is asking 
if you have patient, a patient who is already on anticoagulation for whatever reason, maybe atrial fibrillation, and they come in as a COVID patient, do you continue with the same dose of anticoagulation or how do you go about with this particular patient? The, the American College of Cardiologists, I recommend you just uh, continue with the full anticoagulation, depending on what the drug which you have. Okay, and uh, Martin Waweru uh, would like to know uh, with the, the trend that we are seeing um, with the COVID-19 cases going upwards in the country, is it advisable to give aspirin prophylactically to patients who are at high risk of coagulability, e.g. Ob uh, obese patients? No, that is a question which has not been addressed. Most of these patients, they come and they spend a very short time in the health facilities. So the clinical investigations are still being designed. So no, I have not come across a study that has focused on the platelets. So the WHO our recommendation is still not very clear on whether to give antiplatelet anti or not. But what is very clear is that it is endothelial damage with a thrombin. So anticoagulation as well as a role, but the role of antiplatelet is not has not been established. Okay, and Dr. Sonigra is asking, is there any difference in outcome uh, in patients who are given low molecular heparin versus unfractionated heparin? I think that trick question has been addressed by Dr. Ann. Okay. Good, and uh, Dr. Iraya is asking, are there any studies showing the risk of bleeding in these patients, uh, the COVID-19 patients who are anticoagulated? Now that uh, people are starting to use uh, anticoagulation as part of the mainstay treatment, any studies on the risk of bleeding? No, actually bleeding is not an issue in this patient. No, no study has ever shown uh, bleeding in this patient. They have fibrinolytic shutdown, enhanced thrombin, and uh, hypercoagulability. So they are more prothrombotic than, so bleeding has not become an issue, even without anticoagulation or during anticoagulation. But the experience has been very short, so it is not very, you cannot say definitely, but so far the experience has not shown any bleeding. Okay, so um, Dr. Lingugi uh, is asking if microthrombi are uh, the main cause of hypoxemia in the lung, uh, why is it that these patients respond to supplemental oxygen? <laughs> <laughs> now, I will refer him to the basic physiology of oxygenation <laughs> of the lung. <laughs> the alveolar oxygen transfer depends on the oxygen tension and the fractional, uh, the, the fraction of inspired oxygen. So what you are basically doing is increase the fraction of inspired oxygen, and that is how you achieve that uh, uh, transfer. Okay, and uh, Dr. Nurani, uh, asking, is there any indication or role for thrombolytics? It's a question that has been addressed and I've seen the mm. studies which have been uh, 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 which have been enrolled, enrolled in patients about thrombolytics and uh, they want to do them up. The results will become obvious in, 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 uh, in 2021. But however, the Chinese experience, yes, they used in, they used, Dr. Wang used uh, thrombolytics and achieved good uh, outcome with thrombolytic in the patients who are being treated for ARDS and the CT scan showed microthrombi. So yes, there is possibility of it being played a role. The only question is that there is not enough data. Okay, so... I can see a group of uh, pediatric anesthesiologists, Dr. Nyamai, Dr. Wamboy, and myself trying to ask uh, about the pediatric patients. So do pediatric patients also have similar risks for suffering um, the thrombosis seen in COVID? And if so, what is the dose of anticoagulation for these patients? 
And from myself, I would like to know, uh, we know that uh, we haven't had a lot of severe disease in the pediatric patients, but uh, reports have come up with a Kawasaki-like uh, presentation that is becoming a discussion now. Uh, does this come about because again of the same uh, microthrombi and thrombotic issues that are coming up with the COVID? Could this explain the Kawasaki presentation we are seeing the pediatric patient? Yeah, okay, I will uh, first keep that one of Kawasaki. I'm not familiar with Kawasaki. Yeah. <laughs> but what I know is that the the risk, the major risk factor for this disease is the expression of the receptors and geotensin converting enzyme, which increases with age. So the older, the more the expression of the receptors. So the DSPK group is a little bit protected. That is at least that is the information which is there. So then now the one that uh, get the disease, now anticoagulation, but you realize not much uh, definitive recommendations can be given for pediatrics because uh, it's a question of judgment. No studies are being done on children. So it's no it's a question of judgment because of lack of uh, studies. Okay, I'll give you a break, Dr. Ogweno. Uh, Dr. Anne Mugara, I believe you're still with us. Some questions for you. Uh, but before we go to... Can I... Yes? Um, I can answer one question about um, the study done on anticoagulation. So in New York, they did an observational study, and it was about 786 patients, and they used low molecular weight heparin. They used um, unfractionated heparin as well as the NOAX, the novel anticoagulants. And actually, there was a slightly increased risk of bleeding, but the benefit was across the board. OK. Yes, and uh, Dr. Ling Gugi uh, also asking about the patient you presented to us. Uh, how were her prognostic or predictive factors early on uh, in terms of D-dimers, uh, LDH and uh, what they were they predictive of survival or non survival? So that is, uh, is it possible to predict if the patient was likely to survive even with therapeutic heparin or not? So for this so, particular patient, what were her numbers like, and could we have been able to predict if the patient will survive or not, even with or without the heparin? Okay, so based on a SOFA score of seven, she probably had like a forty percent chance of survival. Uh, the only marker that we had uh, was that of the D-dimer, which was 10 times above normal. However, we did not, the, we did not do the LDH. Uh, and of course, the CRP was also elevated, which are known to be predictors of uh, severity of disease. And the more severe the disease, the more likely you are to die. So that's the only thing. Of course, her age, her comorbidities were also uh, other risk factors that would have increased her, her risk of not surviving. And therefore, the, after discussion with my colleagues, we decided the plan would be active treatment, however, not for intubation because her survival risk was... Okay. Uh, Dr. Omani, again, is asking about the frailty score. How does this uh, score help in deciding who will require mechanical ventilation? Um, so the frailty score basically would work when we have, we are overwhelmed, when the health system is overwhelmed and we need to decide we have very few ventilators, which is a situation that we have here, and decide who are we going to intubate and who is going to benefit most. So if we are comparing a 50-year-old without comorbidities versus a 65 with comorbidities, the frailty score now helps us decide is it a 65-year-old who is independent and well and fit? Or is it a 65-year-old who is frail, is assisted in most of their activities, is mainly housebound? That helps you decide who, who, who gets a ventilator versus who doesn't. OK, and then uh, Dr. Kinyua uh, as, uh, is asking, uh, how, how did the patient, how do we think the patient, uh, the patient you have presented got the coronavirus, given that the test was done 
12 days later, we had the patient for 12 days before we did the COVID test. And after managing other things and then doing the COVID test, has this advised on routine testing of patients uh, in the unit? Yes, so we, the, yes, indeed, we can't tell whether she got it in the community, she got it from the initial health facility where she was referred from, or she got it while she was on the wards out, we are unable to tell. But yes, we are, it does let us know that we actually do need to test all patients presenting to the hospital, and particularly those that need to be um, admitted into a critical care area or an area that needs uh, more monitoring than, than the usual ward care. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Mugere. And uh, if you have any comments to add, you can add. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I will invite uh, Dr. Angucha Mkobole, one of uh, the Kenyan practitioners who is practicing abroad. Yeah, Dr. Angucha, if you are still with us, uh, kindly go ahead. You have had your hand raised for a while now. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well from Germany. Exactly. Uh, it's a pleasure to actually be with you here to, tonight. First of all, I salute um, Dr. Nabulindo, my former classmate. There are a few things I'd like to actually comment about, and uh, I'd like, I feel that I'm in a position to actually comment about this because. Um, I have had the opportunity of um, treating uh, about 22 patients who, uh, uh, who needed intensive care medicine and about more than uh, 60 patients who are actually on the normal hospital floors. And there are some uh, things that actually, uh, I'm the director of the um, uh, pulmonary critical care unit in Saxony Anhalt. That's the most important pulmonary critically, uh, critical care unit in uh, Saxony Anhalt in Germany. And that would mean I have, uh, my team and I have actually gained a relatively good experience, experience dealing with COVID-19 patients on the front line. First, I would direct my comments to uh, Dr. Mbugwa. I found what she did very, very strategic. She talked about anticoagulation in general without any specific reference to COVID-19, which I find very, very scientific. And this is everything we know. Any, any uh, critical care practitioner knows that every patient who's critically ill needs to be prophylactically anticoagulated. And to be fully anticoagulated if they have a standalone uh, problem that needs to be anticoagulated. So I found that very, very nice. And I found that uh, Dr. Mbugwa didn't try to actually link the two things, COVID and um, anticoagulation. Then I will go to Dr. Ogueno. I must say, Dr. Ogueno, there are many, many things that you actually talked about that I cannot underline. First of all, COVID-19 is a multisystemic illness. We have seen patients who actually have, and first of all, to say that people have not been uh, carrying out aut autopsies is factually wrong. The Chinese didn't do a lot of autopsies. The Americans have come in as Johnny Cam Little is doing autopsies. The Italians started relatively late. Here in Germany, and there's an, uh, there's an article in the Annals of um, Medicine, the first 12 cases that were the, the University of uh, Hamburg, Eppendorf, did autopsy every patient that died off with COVID-19. So up to now, as we speak, they have autopsied slightly more than uh, 170 patients or uh, people who actually died of or with uh, COVID-19. And they published the first series, the first 12 series, very, very rapidly. And there's also the group, they published it in the Annals of um, Internal Medicine. And there's a group around um, uh, Maximilian Ackermann and Tobias Welte of the University of Hanover. They also, their work I find more compelling because what the Hamburger did, they actually just autopsied patients and recorded their, um, their findings. But the people in Hanover, 
they actually autopsied seven patients. The cohort is small. They compared them to, uh, with uh, seven patients who actually had died of high, uh, high, uh, H1N1, and, one, and they compared these two cohorts to patients who actually had died with healthy lungs. And of course, I would underline what Dr. Ogweno says, there's capillaritis, there's uh, microvascular thrombosis in the lungs, uh, there's um, alveolar inflammation and all that. But to actually just pick on this and say that this is now the major problem in COVID-19 and run with it is what I would I would um, term as majoring in the minor and minoring in the major, as my old school master is, used to say. What, what we have seen on the front line with COVID-19, we know that this virus is very neurotropic, and that's why in the beginning you have uh, loss of uh, uh, sense of taste, you have lo loss of smell, you have... Um, you know, such neurological effects. And we know that as, as the sickness uh, advances, and I have a, I've had about five patients who actually had gomal seizures. And uh, when we actually did the CTs and serial CTs and we did MRIs, there was no lesion whatsoever. But at, uh, at autopsy, they actually discovered things like uh, meningitis, like uh, changes. They discovered things like uh, demyelinating changes. They discovered things like um, hemorrhagic uh, encephalitis. So it means this virus causes problems in the head, in the nervous system, central nervous system. We also echo all our patients who come to us. And we realize for majority of them, there actually no regional uh, wall uh, movement abnormalities, but if you do the high, highly sensitive troponins, if you do the anti-proBNP, you see that they are wildly um, high. And when you talk about all these, all these, um, you know, factors, all these D-dimers, I would ask as a critical care specialist, show me a patient who comes to the critical care unit who does not have a uh, uh, whatever an elevated D dimers. Show me a patient who comes to the uh, critical care unit for any other reason. Forget about COVID 19. Who does not have an elevated LDH? Show me a patient who does not come with occasional uh, transaminitis, uh, elevation of um, cholestatic parameters, or who doesn't uh, have kidneys who, who have taken a hit. So for you oh, to take. Uh, Dr. Anguche, uh I would request you to wind in one minute. We are to close at uh, eight o'clock. Just one more minute so that we give uh, the panelists uh, some something. Yeah, so, so the conclusion is to say that, that um, you know, uh, coagulation is the major problem in COVID. I must sit here and say in the spirit of uh, science that whether whereas that is true pathology, pathobiologically, it is not the major problem. And you cannot tell me that anticoagulation alone changes the fate of COVID patients. That is my point. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you for the comments and the sharing of the experience. Uh, because of time, I will probably just uh, give Dr. I will give Dr. Adembesa uh, I hope he's with us to answer one question that one of the participants has asked uh, to show, I mean, to say how our infant and pediatric patients are faring on because Dr. Dembesa is the one in that KU who are hold, uh, having the, most of the patients who have been tested positive. Adembesa, you are there? Okay. Uh, Dr. Adembesa, if you are with us, you can just unmute and uh, talk to us. But meanwhile, Dr. Ogweno, uh, Dr. Matangani is asking about uh, giving prophylactic anticoagulation to patients or citizens who are at high risk, uh, like those with comorbid hypertension, diabetes, or, and they are living in high risk areas, or rather the, what we are calling the hotspots, or people who are working in the healthcare system and they have 
comorbid conditions, is it uh, sensible to basically give them prophylactic anticoagulation? Now, the question I've not. Hello? I'm saying I've not understood the question. He's talking about those patients are already receiving anticoagulation. No. So is, that, is it rational to give them anticoagulation? Not so those ones already on coagulation. Those patients who are working, or rather who live in areas like Old Town, where we are saying they are hotspots right now in the country. They have comorbidities and probably they have advanced age. We know that these particular patients, when they get disease, they get more severe disease. Is there any scientific reason to give them anticoagulation prophylactically? <laughs> I think that is uh, what the question is about. I think now that should be directed to Dr. <laughs> Dr. Ann, the, the physician. The actually, we would say no. There is actually no reason why people should prophylactically be, uh, be given anticoagulation. So long as they can move around, so long as they are healthy, there is actually no indication whatsoever. Because, like I, like I said, Doctor uh, Mugera, any your comments? You've heard, we've heard you, Doctor Anguche. Any comment on um, the same question, Doctor Mugera? So those who are working well perhaps do not need uh, anticoagulation. The ones that maybe should be considered and maybe need to be um, is on an individual basis is those who have been discharged from hospital and maybe they could consider prophylactic anticoagulation. But the working well, I don't think need anticoagulation. Okay. So uh, I would like to stop the question and answer session there. Um, again, we would like to appreciate all of us, the panelists, Dr. Anne Mugere, thank you very much for giving us your time. And uh, Dr. Anguche, thank you for your contribution with the sharing of your experiences. Uh, Dr. Gweno, a uh, very informative um, presentation on part of uh, things coming up and making us uh, be at peace with the rest of the world with the new information. We all appreciate again that this disease is a new disease and it continues changing and information uh, keeps on coming. Some of what we knew two weeks ago is not what we know now. And uh, share, that is why we give a platform to share information and share experiences that is good. We've not been able to answer the question on the pediatric patients and how they are doing. Uh, I would encourage whoever asked that and all of us, the sharing of experience, a local experience a webinar tomorrow by the KNH group is going on at, uh, from around 10, AM. Join that and you'll be able to get uh, information on how our local situation is. So thank you very much. And again, uh, we apologize for the technical hitches. We believe we promise to improve in the next webinars. I will give it back to Dr. Okello. Thank you very much, Dr. Nabulindo. Thanks all who attended and the speakers and to our sponsors and uh, partners Sanofi, thank you very much for working with us this walk. And with that, uh, I say bye and see you next time. Hopefully next uh, Thursday, I think so, we'll confirm in due course. And we can continue for those of us in the anesthesia group, we can continue in some of these discussions on the WhatsApp group and uh, probably get challenge each other and get answers to this. Thank you. Goodbye.